Okay, hello everyone. I'm Connor Henderson. I'm here today to talk about marketing strategy, specifically the MarkStrat brand positioning through R&D and perceptual advertising. I'm also going to touch on brand portfolio management. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, we're going to focus on introducing some concepts conceptually, how to think about brand portfolio management, both in terms of uh, matrices, uh, and then a brand portfolio management chart, and then I'm going to go into Markstrat and talk about positioning, where you have a brand and you have a target segment, and all you want to do is better align your brand to that target segment. So doing research and development to retool your product characteristics, to better align with your target co customer segment and using perceptual advertising so that you're perceived to be meeting the requirements and the needs of your target segment. Okay, so start out, I'm going to go through this thing called the GE matrix or the McKinsey matrix or the BCG matrix. They're all slight variations of the same thing. So it basically started out with General Electric uh, working with the consulting firm McKinsey and then Boston Consulting Group, the BCG, did a, a similar um, kind of analysis framework. And they both try to help you make sense of the position of a portfolio of assets. It could be products, could be brands. Um, and the kind of problem came back in the day when chief executive officers were mainly compensated not by how much value they added to the firm, but based on how big the firm was. So there was this incentive to manage a really big firm that had a, a broad portfolio of products that were sold into different markets and, and sometimes several products in the same uh, market or the same product category where you might have had one high-end product and one kind of uh, middle market product and other maybe on the low end so um, yeah a long time ago if you had a lot of revenue if your firm uh, basically created a bunch of revenue then your compensation as an executive was based off of that so there's this strong desire to acquire companies even if they didn't make the firm overall much more valuable uh, relative to the cost it took to acquire the company but if it just grew the amount of total revenue that the firm had on an annual basis, then the CEO compensation would be a percentage of that. Over time, there are different rules that got enacted and different tax um, implications got enacted such that nowadays most executives are compensated largely through stock ownership and options, stock options. So they're more concerned with the growth in the value of the company, the growth in the value of the shares that they're granted rather than the total size of the company. Okay, so anyways, historically, a long time ago, um, GE, General Electric, had all these different product lines and were in a bunch of different industries, everything from you know consumer electronics and durable goods such as refrigerators to jet engines and big uh, turbines for um, creating electricity. So they wanted a way to kind of systematically evaluate all their different product lines and even think about other products and brands and companies to acquire and think of them as a portfolio of different uh, assets that they could really grow and, and um, hopefully kind of think of their firm as a collection of these different assets. And so they came up with this matrices to evaluate uh, the different assets and to come up with some decision rules on how to manage them. So this uh, visual, this framework, has two axes. So on the x-axis or the bottom axis, and this is weirdly made, so on the right-hand side it's low and on the left-hand side it's high, but what they do is they go ahead and map out the brand or the product's relative strength to the competition. And the most simple way to do that is just think about the market share. So what's the current share of market that your brand has, or your product has relative to the competition? You can also think about profit margin. If you have a higher profit margin than your competition and that thing's stable, then it means you have some strength in the marketplace in terms of your relationship with consumers, how you're evaluated, how you're seen, 
that's sticky, that's lasting, um, that's enabling you to basically capture more value for every unit sold compared to your competition. Um, you can also evaluate your product in terms of the sustainable competitive advantages it has. We've talked about that last time in terms of like knowledge and learned secrets, brands and distributed perceptions, of relationships and shared history. Those can also are all market based um, sources of sustainable competitive advantage. We haven't touched on this that much, but there's also demand and supply side network effects. So on the supply side, it means that you're just so big and you touch so many places in the supply chain that you can get really great economies of scale and it would be hard for another company to come in and recreate that. Um, for instance, one of your suppliers wouldn't, would feel like it was too risky to really invest in a relationship with another um, brand or another manufacturer. So they feel kind of captured by your size and your set of relationships. On the demand side, a network effect is such that for each new customer that demands your product um, and that comes on to be a customer for you, it increases the value of your offering to other customers. So the classic example is like the uh, fax machine or um, the telephone or uh, if you've seen the social network where it talks about Facebook's rise to power. So a telephone is pretty useless unless several people have a telephone. So you have someone to call. And each new person who signs up for telephone service makes the telephone ownership for all the existing customers more valuable. And for the next marginal customer who's considering adding a telephone, it becomes more valuable for them um, to get a telephone because this you know, product that basically is to facilitate communication can do its job better as more people use its um, technologies to communicate. So anyways, that's your brand and product and relative strength. And you can use all type of metrics. Um, you can think about uh, objective things, subjective things. But to some extent, you're trying to plot all of your brand on this x-axis in terms of its relative strength. And then on the y-axis, you're looking at the market or the customer segment that you're going to be targeting. And you're trying to plot its attractiveness. So you can look at its size in terms of units, in terms of dollars. Um, in terms of influence, you can look at its growth, right? Um, if there's lots of risk or uncertainty or asymmetric downside or asymmetric upside. So asymmetric upside would be like option value. Would succeeding with this customer segment unlock further opportunities? So, um, you know, if it's a very influential or trend setting or high prestige uh, segment, then maybe you'd be okay basically trying to win that segment um, even at a loss because it would unlock other options or other opportunities. So you plot out um, all your segments that these brands could potentially target uh, based on their attractiveness. And then what happens is you can kind of then split the whole space that gets plotted out by this X and Y axis and uh, go ahead and kind of think about what to do with different uh, products or brands that reside in different kind of four quadrants. So each of the four quadrants. So there's a name for each quadrant. Um, the first quadrant on the bottom right hand side, which is a dog, like an old dog. And you would want to retire an old dog. So this is a brand that at this point in time has low relative strength in a market that has low attractiveness. And so don't put further money into uh, managing that brand. Go ahead and divest it, sell it off, shut it down. Um, just it's not worth a marginal dollar uh, that could be invested elsewhere. On the bottom, uh, uh, bottom left, it's where you have high uh, strength but low attractiveness, and these are called cash cows. And so you want to hold on to your cash cows. You want to milk them get profit out of them. So this is where you have a really strong position in a segment that maybe used to be attractive, but it's of declining value. And so ideally you can have a portfolio of products and brands where maybe one or two is a cash cow that's, you know, its prospects towards the future aren't great, but it's still, you know, spinning off uh, healthy profits for you. Um, and so you can take those profits and you can reinvest them into 
other uh, opportunities that have higher attractiveness. Usually those other opportunities are going to be the top right quadrant. These are called the question marks. And you can't have too many question marks because they require a lot of attention, a lot of effort, a lot of problem solving. But they're high attractive segments that are unsettled where you currently have low strength, but you think you have a chance to potentially uh, capture that, that strength. So right now, maybe an example would be Zoom. So the CEO of Zoom actually had a different video conferencing startup that was acquired, I believe, by Cisco um, and ended up getting out of Cisco and, and starting Zoom. And for a lot of people, they thought like, oh, you know, it's already pretty mature uh, segment but um, this founder said you know it's going to be growing because more and more people are going to be you know telecommuting video conferencing and so although it's got some mature competitors and my relative position is pretty weak you know compared to skype compared to um webex and, and different established players he's thought well it's still something that um is going to be growing so there's going to be opportunity for kind of a disruptor maybe to come in and add value and so zoom really came in and you know skype had the 3-1 series lead like the golden state warriors against the Cavs, and and zoom came in and transitioned from a question mark to a star so a star would be a highly attractive segment where you have high relative strength and so you want to pour all your um, efforts all your top talent all your uh money basically investable money into growing your stars okay so most companies um that are somewhat mature will have a portfolio of brands that are at different quadrants and ideally um you have a brand in, in the star quadrant and if you do you don't have to focus about diversifying so much but certainly if you have a brand that's really in this uh cash cow quadrant then you want to think about okay is there some question marks we can invest into that hopefully can be converted into stars. So um, in MarkStrat, you have the opportunity to manage multiple brands. Some of them will start out as stars. Some of them will start out as question marks. Eventually, some of your stars or question marks might turn into cash cows or into dogs. And you have the potential to go after some other question marks that could turn into stars. So for MarkStrat, you really want to think through the game in stages. There's both the brand management um, stage that you kind of find yourself in to start. That's just making sure that you're targeting uh, each of your brands at a segment that you can win that's somewhat attractive and taking the steps to align yourself very closely in all aspects of your marketing mix to that segment that you're targeting. And the second stage is kind of evaluating your brand portfolio and thinking about where do you want to invest in, you know, some potential question marks. So um, initially, the first thing you want to do is just think about picking a segment to target. And you do that based on evaluating all the segments in terms of their attractiveness and the potential for you to get a relatively strong position with that target segment. Then once you've picked a segment for each of your two brands you start with, um, you're going to use conjoint and the semantic scales research reports to decide on product modifications that you need to make in order to better align yourself with that segment's changing needs. So if that segment seems to uh, want some product characteristics that you don't have really aligned very well, but you're better than the competition, they'll buy from you, but it creates a vulnerability for the competition to come in with a big modification and basically become a better fitting brand for what that segment needs. So it's important that you kind of shut down any gap between what you uh, have to offer and what your target segment wants. So we're going to talk about how to do that in a bit. Next, after you've done that, you've done your um, research and development project, you're going to let a period take place um, in which the simulation runs. So after you've made your decision, the simulation runs and your research and development team, the engineers work with the operations, logistics people, and they create a product that you can go ahead and take to market. And so at that point, you go to your brand portfolio and you update it. You uh, find the brand portfolio decision tile. You click on the brand name that you want to update 
and you toggle down to modify and then at that point it'll allow you to select the name of the updated R&D project which you'll use to manufacture and sell under the brand name. So for instance if you are managing a brand name soft and you've gone ahead and increased the processing power um, using an R&D project then once that R&D project is complete you would go to your brand portfolio you'd click on the brand name soft you would say modify and you would select the new R&D project that had just been completed that basically has all the same product characteristics as before except now it also has uh, better processing power um, and so you'll still maintain all the brand awareness and all the brand equity you've built up but you'll have a product that better aligns with your target segment and then once you have that you go to this next bullet point and you want to promote the fact that your product has better fit. So you use uh, perceptual advertising objectives which means that you go to your advertising agency and you basically tell them don't just create brand awareness for me with my target segment but help convince them that my brand has the processing power they're looking for. And so you can use the multi-dimensional scaling research report or the semantic um, scales report and note the brand perceptions that uh, you currently have, what the segment, the target segment wants, their ideal values, and then go ahead and use those ideal values to um, uh, put them as the objective. And that will have your target segment start to see you as fitting with what they want in terms of their ideal values on the dimension that you've gone ahead and, and had your advertising focus on. Um, continually moving forward, you need to figure out how to allocate your budget efficiently across advertising and commercial team. There's lots of different places to get clean, to glean some insights on how to do that. I won't walk through them all in detail. That's one place for you to differentiate yourself from other student teams. But one thing you can look at is the experiments that will give you hints of the relative ROI, the return of investment, from increased investments on advertising or commercial team. So for every dollar you spend on hiring an, another salesperson or on increasing your advertising spending, what's that do in terms of generating additional sales? And you can kind of try to uh, find out where there's kind of most elasticity or responsiveness to your spending in terms of sales. And getting that right will help you be more, uh, just allocate your budget more effectively um, and then your budget will grow the next period. Um, also, you want to dial in your production. You can use the marketing plan to estimate demand, which is based on estimates of the segment size and your managerial judgment on how much of the market share you're going to get for each customer segment. And then big picture, you want to think about your brand portfolio overall. Use the GE BCG matrix. Think how are your brands all well positioned for growth. Um, do you have a cash cow that's generating profits for you, but you need to invest um, in a new product or a new brand that, that could grow more? You can expand your brand portfolio to reach a high potential growth segment, such as the savers or shoppers, or just a different segment that's underserved. So it could be the explorers or the professionals. Um, and then you also can target uh, the Vodite market, which is like the virtual reality headset market. So you can try to create a brand new product um, for that category. So you could be first to enter that market, or you could sit back and wait for other brands to launch in the Vodite market and then use the data that can be provided from um, the research reports once someone has launched to try to go in with a you know sniper shot perfect launch of a brand that's really going to resonate with the customer segments. Okay, in terms of charting out your decisions over time, you're going to have a limited budget, so you want to uh, kind of stage out what you're going to do when. So I have an example of um, for Team S, Firm S, they have Soft and Solo as two brands. You can very simply plot out over time, so your current round and then plus additional rounds into the future, what you're going to do. So what target segment are you going after? What um, R&D spending are you going to make? What percent of your ad budget are you going to put towards this brand? And how many commercial team sales people are you going to hire? So for soft, I might start out targeting both the savers and the shoppers. 
and kind of hold that position for a while while no brands can um, have had time to customize themselves to align themselves to either segment. I might be able to have one ill-fitting product serve both segments. But eventually I'm going to consolidate my focus just on the savers as I make modifications of my brand specifically for them and as other brands make modifications specifically for the shopper segment it becomes less and less feasible for me to serve two segments with differing wants and differing needs um, over time. In terms of r and I'm going to start out with about a one million dollar spend to do a rather large change to my product characteristics that can fit better with what savers seem to be wanting over time. I make that expenditure now and then it starts to become uh, available uh, next round um, and so I can launch it and then at that point I won't need to make any immediate changes but over time I might add in an additional expenditure to try to correct any gaps that arise between what I'm offering and what they want as their tastes and needs and desires change over time. Um, in terms of advertising spending, I might start out putting 60% of my advertising dollars towards soft as I generate the majority of my revenue from them, but then over time I'm going to um, toggle it to be more 50-50, or at this point I could do drop down to 20% for a while as I invest in other brands. Um, I'll get to that in a second. So I kind of think about where I want to um, kind of allocate my advertising dollars based on the objective I might have. Uh, in this round, it's going to be um, a place where I can go ahead and start using perceptual advertising to let people know that I have characteristics that match what they want. I'm going to continually expand the size of my commercial team and, and check in with my distribution research reports to see how much coverage I have of the key retail channels that my target segment tends to shop at. Um, for my brand Solo, I might start out targeting the shoppers and the explorers, and then over time maybe I'm focused just on the shoppers. I might do a $1 million R&D spend to initially try to close the gap between what I have to offer and what um, they're looking for, but I might immediately follow that up with another $500,000 to do additional small tweaks as I might not be able to afford to do the complete change that's required to fit well with the shopper's needs um, because my initial product is so far off of what they're looking for. It would take a lot of money to change many different attributes in a major way, and so I just focus on a few product characteristics at a time. And that is less of a challenging problem for my engineers because if I say, okay, keep everything the same except just increase the battery and the processing power, they're like, all right, we can figure that out. But if I'm like, let's change everything right now, it's like, whoa, you're changing too many things at once. That's going to cost a lot more money. So I might stage it out over time given I have a limited budget. Um, and again, kind of manage my ad spending across my different brands. I might launch a third brand eventually that could be, um, if it has an O as its second uh, letter, um, it means it's going to be targeting the Sonite uh, product category, so it'll be another laptop-tablet combo. If it has an E as the second letter, that means it's going to target the Vodite, so that's that virtual reality headset, so I don't really know which one I'll do exactly, but um, let's say I'm going to go after the Vodite market. It might cost me, let's say, eight to ten million to initially do the big R&D project to launch a new virtual reality headset. And um, you know, when I launch it, I might uh, support it by spending 40% of my total ad budget on this market because I'm trying to create awareness and educate the market for a brand new category. So it might require a big initial spend. Then I'll toggle um, that spending down over time. Um, you can see I cut spending with soft because I'm assuming at this point in time I already have a brand that fits pretty well with my target segment so it doesn't require as much advertising to change their mind or to increase awareness. I've already built those up over time. Um, anyway, so the whole point is just you can't do everything you want to do all at once. Otherwise, you'll do everything poorly. So you want to stage it out just because you have a limited budget and in the real world, your managers and your employees have, you know, limited time, um, limited, uh, you know, number of projects they can focus on. So 
Um, it's good to kind of map out all the things you want to do and use time as a way to unlock a more extensive list of things you could do well, but just stage it out over time. So that's the point of this exercise. Okay, when you get to the Mark's Jet world, the place you do um, research and development is under Decide R&D. These slides are available on our website that kind of map out um, everything you kind of want to do, but I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen with you so that you can um, go, I said, go ahead and just watch me go through it. Okay, so I pulled up a team from the winter term right now, and I'm going to walk you through the process of doing an R&D project to increase your fit between what your product has to offer and what your target segment wants. And then I'll go ahead and demonstrate how to do perceptual advertising as well. All this is facilitated by um, just these understanding these different research reports. I'm not going to explain them in a lot of detail for time's sake, but uh, you can go ahead and read about all of this under the participant handbook. And if you want to jump to the most relevant section, um, you can go ahead and go to positioning and research and development. So this page 50 through page 56 kind of provides a nice overview of what I'm going to cover today. Um, it also helps if you have like a shared Google sheet or Excel sheet in which you can put a lot of this information. I think I'll open up an Excel sheet um, just to kind of facilitate the taking notes of the relevant piece of information that you need. So I'll go ahead and put this over here to the side and then um, wait, I don't want you. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Okay, cool. So I'm ready to go. All right, so first I got to get an overall sense of the competitive landscape. So I'm just going to look at the multidimensional scaling, which has every brand um, on a positioning map uh, against all the uh, key segments and their ideal values. So you can kind of get a quick overview of how you compare it to others. So right now I'm playing for Team T, the Titans, and it's round nine, so this is more in the future. Um, there's quite a few different teams in this simulation. So there's Team L, there's Team T, there's Team N, there's Team R, and M and S are um, the full set of teams. And then you have your segments, the professionals, the high earners, the explorers, the shoppers, and the savers. Okay, so if I'm Team T and I have this brand uh, Tone, it's not really well positioned for any customer segment. So on the y-axis here, I have performance, which is kind of a multi-attribute combination of a number of factors. And on the x-axis, I have economy right here. And uh, the problem is that um, there's these two kind of segments that both are reasonably close to me, the professionals and the high earners, but their ideal values or what they're looking for are further away from me than other competitors. So high earners, if they're looking for an economy of around negative nine and performance around a negative uh, two or 1.6 as it shows here. There's options for them to buy Nova and Roll that are much closer than Tone. And for Explorers, there's Rock right here, which is closer to them. And for Professionals, there's um, Loop. And so I need to pick a segment to reposition myself, Tone. Maybe once upon a time, I was well positioned for both of these segments or all these segments, but over time, my competitors did a better job of aligning themselves to what these segments want, and the segments might have changed in what they were looking for, and they drifted away from me. Um, there's a third dimension here, convenience, and on convenience, I'm closer to what professionals and higher earners are looking for. So if I just look at this very quickly in terms of um, competitive strength, it looks like I would have a tougher time going after the high earners because there's already two competitors that are well positioned for high earners than it would be for professionals. Now, m maybe high earners is a much more attractive segment. So even though it's, um, you know, more competitive to go after them, uh, it would be worth it. The prize is big enough. But we're just going to assume at this stage that professionals and high earners are equally attractive looking forward. So I'm going to try to 
reposition tone for professionals. So in my um, kind of table over here, I'll say tone reposition for professionals. Um, and then I might know like uh, what I want to do is tone perceptions. And then I might have um, professionals ideal. And if I want, I could have my competition, which would be like loop perceptions. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and look at, on all product characteristics, how I compare tone to professionals on everything and see if I need to make some changes. So um, if I look down here at the bottom, you can see that there's a number of brand characteristics or product characteristics that kind of merge together to influence these kind of high level big picture dimensions through which consumers have these kind of fuzzy conceptions of all the brands. So economy is basically determined by price at this stage in the game. Performance is mainly based on display and processing power and convenience kind of merges together. Features, design, and battery. Um, but anyways, so for the purpose of R&D, now that I have my target segment identified, I want to start out with semantic scales. And so semantic scales is basically where, um, you know, it's all semantics, right? Um, it's just these kind of big uh, evaluations by 600 individuals of every single brand on a one to seven scale from low to high on each dimension of a product um, or each kind of uh, product characteristic. So for my brand, um, that I'm managing in this case, I was thinking about uh, doing an R&D switch for tone. I know that on a one to seven uh, scale, I have to see how my features, my design, my battery, display, processing, power, and price line up to what my segment's looking for. Um, Okay, so my brand tone is perceived as a 3.7, a 6.5, um, 1.5, 5.1, 4.5, and 5.8. That's how my brand is rated on that 1 to 7 survey scale, 1 being low, 7 being high. The professional's ideal value is also given in the segment. So they ask people, you know, what are you looking for in a segment? And they are rated it on that same 1 to 7 scale. Now, I don't look at this first chart, which shows what people want. I always scroll down to the bottom, where it shows for the last couple periods how things have been trending. So from period 7 to period 8 to period 9 in this case, I can see if these numbers are increasing or decreasing, because the R&D project takes one period to complete, and then I can start selling it. And by the way, it's going to take me a little bit of time to get people aware of the changes of my product through perceptual advertising. So I want to project out into the... F oh. Excuse me, I had to sneeze. Uh, if I had more time, I'd edit that out, but I'm, I'm not going to. It's late at night right now. Okay, so um, I want to kind of predict where they're headed and get out in front of it. So for uh, features, they went from 4.4 to 4.3 to 4.2. If I did an R&D now, it would be available um, next period, which would be period um, uh, 10. I just completed period 9. Um, but I want to plan for period 11, let's say. So I would say at this rate, it might be 4.1 and 4.0. So the ideal value is going to be a 4. The nice thing is I'm currently at 3.7, so they're coming closer to me and what they're looking for in terms of features. In terms of design, they are kind of stuck stable here at a 5.3. So we'll say that remains stable. It's a 5.3. My value is a 6.5. In terms of battery, we're looking at going from a 4.7 to a 4.6. So it's slight changes. We might say it's going towards a 4.5. Um, for display, it's slightly taking up from 6 to 6.1, so go ahead and put in a 6.2. For processing power, um, professionals are going from 5.9 to 6.1, so again, we'll put that at 6.2. And then for price, um, they were at 6.0, then they've gone all the way up to 6.3, so we'll say 6.5, which is nice, because if I'm going to increase my power and... Um, 
increase my display, that might increase the cost of goods sold, it might increase the cost, my base cost to produce my product, and so it's nice that they're increasing their willingness to pay as the specifications they require are getting um, more uh, kind of advanced. On loop, just out of curiosity, I might write down what loop has to see how far off I am. Um, and let's see, loop is a 4.8, um, 5.6, 5.0, 6.2, 6.1, 6.2. So they map on a really nice for right here compared to me. I'm, I'm quite a bit off on um, battery. Wow, I'm, I'm way off. The loop has is, is got me there. In terms of design, my design is better than what um, professionals want, but same with loop, and loop's actually closer to the, what they want. So we're both over-serving the professional's need for design. Um, for features, I'm closer to them, but they're on the high side, I'm on the low side. So those are all places of vulnerability um, in terms of what pros looking for and what uh, the perceptions are for me. So let me go ahead and... Um, I want to wrap text real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and write down what tone has in terms of um, the actual characteristics. And then I want to write down what um, pros I actually want. And then I might write down what loop um, actually has. And so we can think about perceptions in terms of how a brand is um, perceived. And we can also think about what a brand actually has in terms of its like actual characteristics. And so um, that's the next step in terms of what we need to figure out. So we find that out under the market report right here. And at the bottom of it, it tells us um, for each brand what their actual physical attributes are on each of these characteristics. So for Loop, my close competitor, what do they actually have? They have a 15 for features, an 8 for design, 72 for battery, 35. 84 and they're priced at 550. Um, for me, what I actually have for tone would be 12, 10, 24, 28, 59, and 540. So I can compare the differences here in terms of what is actually uh, actual differences I have and then also look at the perceptions and perceptions and actual characteristics correlate pretty well, not perfectly, because with advertising you can kind of shift those around. I'm um, sorry if this is kind of hard to see. Let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. Um, I'll zoom in right here. Okay, hopefully that's a little bit clearer for you to see. Sorry, these numbers are small, I, I'm sure. Um, Okay, so another thing I can do is going back to semantic scales, I can try to, um, what I need to do now is figure out what the pros actually want moving forward, okay? So I need to know the relationship between these one to seven ratings and the actual characteristics. And you can find that out um, in these access additional charts. So you see it says, design powerful R&D projects described in section six of the Markstrat handbook. That's what we're going for. So when you click that link, there's actually two different uh, kind of tabs of information. What we care about is the relationship between characteristics, so the actual characteristics of products, and perceptions. And what this does is it simply graphs out on the x-axis the actual characteristics, so the actual kind of levels of each product characteristic, and then on the y-axis it does that 1 to 7 rating and it also puts on the ideal uh, points for each segment. And so this plotted line is just based on 
the uh, the points are all the points of the brands that are currently being sold. So like there's a brand uh, that has actual features of 18 and it's rated as a 6.2 on the feature scale. For us, I know that like my brand tone has 12. So if I go to around 12 and kind of go up, I'll find a brand that's, you know, uh, has 12 um, features and it's rated as a 3.7. Well, that's me right here. What about loop? So there are 15. So there's somewhere out here. Um, there they are. And there are 4.8, right? And so um, professionals, what they're looking for, it looks like a, a 4 is where they're trending to, towards to a 4. So that would be somewhere around between 11 and 14. Well, I'm already between 11 and 14. So there's not a big incentive for me to make a change here. So I'm just going to say 12. And one thing that's great is if I can keep my value on some things to be what it already was, that gives my engineers uh, just takes one hassle off the board because they don't have to worry about changing that. They can just focus on a few product characteristics that I do think I need to change. So that's for features. And you go through and you actually just do that one by one for each of these different product characteristics. So for design, you start to see some funky things with this line, right? So there's one brand that has design of seven that's seen as a 4.3. There's another brand that has, um, has got seven, they're seen as a 4.7, and there's a third one that has seven that's a 5.0. The differences for that, where you see the exact same actual characteristic of seven, but differences in perceptions, that comes from advertising, right? So two brands might, you know, you think of a, going to buy um, a diamond, right? You go buy a diamond from Walmart or Tiffany's. It could be the exact same diamond, but because it's associated with these different brands and they have different advertising and they're in different outlets, you're going to have a very different perception. Um, same thing here, right? So if you buy a TV or a laptop um, from Microsoft versus Apple versus uh, a Google Chromebook um, or Samsung, they might have the exact same processing power, but you'll have different perceptions based on, on the brand and the price point and stuff like that. Um, and so in this case, we're headed after professionals and they kind of map on somewhere between, let's say a seven and an eight. Um, my actual design is, uh, according to this, it's a 10, which is actually quite a lot. So I'm perceived as a 6.5, I'm way out here, um, which seems, to be even above what the higher earners want. And my competition over here is an eight. Um, it seems to me that if they're at a 5.3, an eight could be somewhat overkill. Um, a seven could be appropriate. So I might think about lowering mine to a seven and that's gonna pull cost out of uh, how much it takes for me to produce a unit of um, my laptop design. So um, that's one change that I can actually use. It might cost me money to make the change, right? My engineers need to figure out how to make the change, but it's going to save me money for each unit that I produce moving forward. Okay, for battery, we can see that professionals are up here next to explorers, um, and they're somewhere in the range around like between let's say it looks like somewhere close to 67. Um, there's no brands that are near there. The closest brand is a 72 for battery. Unfortunately, my battery is just a 24. So I'm way down here at, at the extreme and I'm seeing as a 1.5. That's a big problem. I really need to fix that. So I need to be up here in the 60 range. My closest competitor has 72. Um, that might be overkill. So I'll go ahead and put in 67. Um, let's see, for display, I can go ahead and look at what professionals are looking for. They want something with quite a bit of display. I currently have 28, so I'm around here somewhere. There I am at 5.1. Um, my closest competitor is in the sixes at 35. So I'm not going to overcomplicate this. They're at 30, 35, they're at 6.2. That's what professionals want. I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy them. It would be nice if I remembered if battery was increasing or decreasing or stable. I might try to get ahead of my competition if it was increasing. Um, 
but they seem to have it pretty good locked in. So I'll just do 36. So I have a I can be a slightly better than them. Okay, processing power. Um, processing power is got professionals at the high end at at 6.0. That's somewhere around 84. Seems to map on pretty good to what they want there. Um, I'm currently at 59, so I'm down here at 4.5. That's not going to work, um, so I would need to increase it. And at 88, it's 6.3. Um, at 84, it's it's 6.0. My closest competitor is at 84. I'll go ahead and. Uh, you know, again, this would help to know what the trend is. I forgot that, but if I was working with a teammate, potentially they could have the trending on uh, a different. Actually, I can look at this ideal point evolution real quick. So, for processing power, professionals are increasing where they're headed. So, I'm going to try to get out ahead of this and go to 86. Um, okay. And then finally, for price, um, I'm at 540. They're at uh, 550. Um, so eventually I might increase my price when I have better fit. I won't do that right away. Um, but if you will look at higher earners and professionals, professionals are willing to spend quite a bit. There's 550 at 6.6. .6. I'm at 540, but I'm seen as much less expensive. But professionals are willing to pay more. Perhaps their company's paying for it. And their budget is you know $600, so they're okay with that. Funny enough, there's another brand that's being sold for 550 that's down here at 5.4. I bet they're going after high earners. They want to charge a high price, but they want to be seen as uh, not that expensive. So somehow they've been able to convince high earners that 550 is actually you know, not that big of a price because they've done some advertising that maybe makes uh, high earners feel like they're getting a lot of value out of it. Maybe they're talking about how you're going to use it for three years and, um, you know, for the you know, 550 divided by over three years isn't that much money. Maybe they're giving zero percent financing, right? So marketing can sometimes bend the relationship between actual characteristics and perceptions of the brands with those characteristics. Okay, so at this point, um, my long-term pricing might be. It seems like it's trending upward, so my long-term price might be 555. But I'm gonna wait to um, enact that price change after I've changed the rest of my product. Okay, so that's um, this extra, you know, set of uh, charts that is provided down here at the bottom of the semantic scales report. So these are my objectives that I want to enter into R&D. Um, before I do so, I want to make sure that these changes are necessary. And one thing I can do is I can look at conjoint. Conjoint is based on prototype evaluations. So the researchers go ahead and create prototypes with varying different uh, levels of different characteristics. And so it's like all these different combinations of different characteristics with different levels. And then people evaluate the prototype, like the holistic evaluation. And then the researchers can use some statistics to back out how much um, the consumers care about each characteristic and how sensitive they are to different levels in each characteristic. So for me, I'm going after the professionals. They mostly care about price, then processing power, and then um, display and uh, design. Because each time you want to make a change to any of these, you have to make a change to like several different prototypes. Um, it's like a factorial problem. You can't make a bazillion prototypes, and so they're only able to evaluate changes to a few different um, characteristics like price is relatively easy because you just tell the person taking the study that it's at a different price but all these other things require a little bit more effort um, to make the changes so we only are really getting information on design display and processing power it varies for each segment so we want to go ahead and find the segment we're targeting in this case it's the professionals and what we observe here is that um, for design their utility or their likelihood to make a purchase for a product with design of seven is actually much lower than one with eight, nine, or ten. So I had a plan to go for seven here, where I used to be ten, but um, it seems like ten isn't adding value. It's just going to add the cost of me to produce it. But nine's pretty good, and eight is excellent. So I'm going to change this from seven to eight, um, which actually matches what Loop has. 
Okay, for um, display, my display was a 28. Uh, my research indicated I need to be at closer to 36, which was similar to what um, loop had. And so that's just confirmed by this. So 34 was rated the highest of the four options that were looked at, 22, 28, 34, and, and 40. Um, I see a slight uptick from 28 to 34 and a slight decline from 34 to 40. And so with my plan of 36 versus Loop's actual level of 35, um, this seems to fit that. In, in actuality, it might be uh, overkill. So it doesn't seem to be adding a lot of value. Now, I don't actually have 36 as a value that was evaluated in the prototype. So I don't know for certain how consumers would react, but I'm going to go ahead and make this um, uh, just be, let's say, a 34, because it might be a little bit less expensive to make the change and then also to produce it. Um, in terms of processing power, I seem to have hit this right on the head with 84 here. In fact, that's actually what Loop has. I'm going to go with 86 to be on the high end of this distribution. Maybe 86 would actually outperform 84, but it wasn't evaluated. You know, I got to be different on some dimensions, so I might actually crank that up to 87. And then in terms of pricing, of the prices evaluated, they really weren't interested in uh, laptops being sold for 350, 434. It was moderately okay. They loved 517. They were pretty tolerant of 600. So 555 seems reasonable um, based on the competition and based on this graph. Um, plus the ideal evaluation was trending up. So I'm going to stick with that plan. So now I have my plan of what I want to offer the market. It's right here in yellow, but I currently am not selling that. So this is where I go to my decision and I go to R&D and I would just start a new Sonite project. I need to name it something. So this is just for the engineers. This is my internal name, like my secret code name. And I'm going to call it uh, PR, PO, Tone, uh, let's say N, Tonin, N for new, or maybe I could say it's, you know, V3, uh, version 3, assuming I already have like a version 2. And my objective is to um, modify tone to better fit with professionals. Um, trending interests. And then I just go ahead and enter these numbers as I have written down there in yellow. So it's a 12 here. Um, for design, it's going to be an 8. For battery, it's going to be 67. For display, it's going to be 34. And for processing power, it's going to be 87. So I go ahead and enter all these. And then I got to quickly huddle with my engineers and find out how much it's going to cost them to you know hire all the engineering talent and work on this problem to basically uh, be able to create a laptop with these specifications because they've already been manufacturing laptops with some uh, of these characters the same I kept features the exact same design actually lowered from 8 to 10 so I'm from 10 to 8 so that should be feasible for them but I made somewhat significant changes here and so there's two elements of cost. There's the cost it takes up front for my engineers to design this. This is the budget allocated this period. Um, and uh, that I'm going to ask my engineer, my head of product, my head of design to quickly get together and go ahead and estimate how much it's going to cost and make sure that they are on the aggressive side of estimating such that they don't get halfway through the year and be like, damn, we don't have enough budget to finish this. Um, so that's one number I'm going to need to estimate, and I do that with this run online query. And the other number I have to put in is how much am I willing to um, give them like flexibility in terms of how much it's going to cost them to produce each unit on an ongoing basis. That's the base cost to produce a unit. So I'm going to specify a base cost of, it would help if I knew what my old base cost was. Um, I'm going to say that it'll be, uh, let's say, 250. Um, and I'll run an online query. So it says that it would cost me uh, $960,000 to go ahead and build out this product. I don't know why these are in the wrong spot. Um, that's somewhat disturbing. Uh, 
Okay. But uh, that that would cost $960, $960,000 for them to get ready so that they could start manufacturing a product with these specifications. And it would have a base cost of, of $250. Um, it seems that based on that, that I uh, told them to enter something that's lower than the minimum possible. So I could also say, just give me the minimum possible. Okay, here it says for t uh, they could actually ha have me give them more money up front, $1.64 million, and they could go ahead and create a product that only costs $209 per unit to manufacture. So let's say I don't need, um, let's say I'm, I'm limited in my budget. I don't think I can afford $1.64 million right now, but I don't need a product uh, manufactured so inexpensively. So I might put this at like 225. Maybe that is something that I think can work with a recommended retail price ultimately of $550, right? I'm going to price this product at 550. So producing it at 225 wouldn't be too bad. And I don't have, you know, $1.64 million to spend on this. So as I update it, then, then my estimate for my upfront cost drops down to $1.3 million. When I hit create, my budget will be adjusted. Um, and so, yeah, it goes negative. And so I'm going to need to cut spending out of something else. So in this case, I could like go to my marketing mix and tone maybe currently is sucking, right? I have extra inventory because no one wants to buy it because it doesn't fit well. Um, so I'm going to drop this down to maybe 70,000 units and maybe I'll drop my price down a little bit um, because right now it's, um, you know, not very competitive and I'm going to not spend so much on advertising because um, no one wants to buy my product anyways. Um, it doesn't fit well with any consumer segment. So if I drop this down uh, to 2 million and just make this 200,000, um, my budget now updates and I'm, I'm in the positive. So I took a bunch of money out of advertising spending because there's no point in going and advertising a product that doesn't fit well with people's needs. I'll ramp this up the next period when I'm done with the R&D. And so if I go to decision review, I can see that um, I've done, I have an R&D project set to go. Um, P-Tone version 3, it's got my objective, it's got the characteristics I want, it's got a base cost that's reasonable, I see the budget, and I'm like, okay, that's worth it. Um, and so I'm ready to go with R&D. Um, at the end of this round, it would run and it would basically be completed. And then the next time I logged in, it would be decision round 10. And I could look at my R&D report and I would see that I had um, successfully completed. Uh, it looks like they have a version 2 already in here. So I would have completed version 3. And um, ideally, you're not having to do tons of different versions that are very different from each other because each time you make a change it ideally fits well with the consumer segment so um, anyways in this case once it's completed I can go into my brand portfolio I can click on my brand I can click modify my brand and I can pick my base project that I want to base it off of right now I only have these five options because these are all the completed R&D projects I have but next period I would have a new one that would be P-Tone version 3 and I could select that and then confirm modify. Um, in this case, it already is based on that one. So it's saying, you didn't actually change it. What are you doing? Let's say I want to go back to the OG, the original tone. OK, let's go ahead and do that. Um, if you do make one of those changes, any inventory you had will be sold off at, to liquidators. So like overstock.com, something like that, right? So you'll sell any of your existing inventory at a slight loss and get ready to go to market with your brand new and improved um, product. You also want to do perceptual advertising um, in your marketing mix so that your consumer segments know that your product now has the characteristics they're looking for. So in this case, um, I really need to improve my fit with professionals in terms of, let's say, performance. So once I get my processing power, what are the things that impact performance again? It's processing power and display. So once those two things are improved, I can go ahead and tell my advertising agency that I want professionals to view me as having performance of 
13.9 or 14, right? Um, I can also look at the trend lines for the ideal values. So for professionals, what are they trending? It seems like for performance, they're trending up, right? So they're at 12.9 in period 7, then 13.4 in period 8, then 13.9 in period 9. So um, maybe they're going to want 14 or even 15 in the future. So as soon as my product is ready to go, my R&D project is completed, and I update my brand portfolio, the next step is going to my marketing mix, making sure I have the right brand selected, setting a perceptual objective. In this case, I'm doing multidimensional scaling. I want my performance to be conveyed to people that I have 15. Um, and at this point, I have a big budget because my R&D project is completed. I want to make sure I spend money on advertising research. That basically gives my advertising agency a lot of ammunition to test and be creative with the ad. So the ad is going to be very persuasive, very high quality. So I might up this to like 15% of my total spend. So if I jump this up to, let's say, um, 2.5 million, and then, uh, so let's say, what's 15% of um, 2.5 million? Well, 10% would be um, 250,000 plus another half of that. So uh, what's that, 375? So maybe I jump this up to 375 or like 390. Right, so I'm really heavily investing in creating high quality convincing content that conveys to consumers that um, I have performance of 15, where before they thought my performance was like a 10 or 11. So it's a big change in perceptions and it might take multiple periods for me to convince them. Also, it seems like um, my selection to focus on professor professionals is different than what this team was doing. I guess they were going after high earners. But um, at this stage in the game, I'm going to say, man, I can't get the high earners. Like, two other brands have beat me, so I'm going to go all in on professionals. Anyway, so um, that's basically how you manage your individual brand. Um, you do R&D and you do marketing mix to basically close the gap between what your segment that you're targeting is looking for and how you're perceived. Um, it doesn't look good for Tone at this stage of the game, but it, early on in the game, let's say when it was period one or period two, you know, here's Tone here, here's professionals there. Man, they could have easily won professionals. They were actually close to high earners and close to professionals. That's probably why they didn't go after either of them and they were kind of left in the dust where other brands, you know, did big customizations. And high earners and professionals changed what they were looking for. So if you look at period two versus period nine, right now high earners are down here, professionals are up here. So only the best brands, Nova and Loop, were managed to predict and stick with the changing preferences of the target segments where you look at tone, tone's almost where it was at the start, right? If we look at period two, Tone was right here. Tone barely moved. They like slightly came this direction. Um, versus like higher earners and professionals drastically changed and all these other brands adapted to fit better. Um, if we look at period zero, right, uh, you can see that there's no brands that are really well aligned with any of the segments. Versus if we go to like period, you know, eight or something, look at soft is right there closing in on savers. You got toe time. I guess uh, Team T decided, well, we suck so much with Tone, let's launch a new brand to go after shoppers. And they nailed it, right? They came out with a product that was exactly what shoppers want, except for maybe a little bit more expensive. But you can be a little bit more expensive if you are good on the other dimensions. In terms of convenience, Toe Time is pretty good. They're right there neck and neck with Solo in terms of what shoppers are looking for. And Noon is also in the neighborhood. So, um, anyways, it's really kind of a race. And to kind of stick with what your segment's looking for. I hope you found that useful. That was about an hour. If you watch it on, you know, one and a half or two speed, hopefully it won't be too long. But um, I can't emphasize enough uh, using the participant handbook, um, especially I want to point out if you're doing Vodite and you want to be first to market, um, it's really important for you to check out, um, where is it? I want to say it's page 54. Yeah, the case of a new market. So you're going to try to go in to Vodite without much 
useful information in terms of the research reports. And so this is a little formula I can give you like a close approximation of how to convert from the semantic scales ratings on a 1 to 10 scale, I mean a 1 to 7 scale, into actual attributes that your engineers can say, okay, I know how to actually create a product that has processing power of, you know, 50, but I don't know how to give you a rating on a 1 to 7. Well, that's the marketing researcher, that's the brand manager's job of converting those numbers to something an engineer can work with. Okay, so um, I hope that makes sense. I hope it's clear. If it's not, you have this uh, report right here um, to work with. And anyways, good luck.